Uh, our first speaker today is Hank Anderson. Hank joined StatEase in 1998, moving on to the programming team and then becoming vice president of software development in 2020. He has spent the last two decades putting his expertise to use in the development and refining of design expert software and now StatEase 360. He is also the lead developer, developer of DexPy, an open source Python module for doing design of experiments. Hank graduated with a bachelor's degree in computer science from Metropolitan State University in St. Paul in 2004. So we are going to welcome our first speaker, uh, Hank Anderson. All right, thanks, Sherry. Um, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I've really enjoyed the, the talks yesterday. Uh, like Sherry said, I've been working on Design Expert for uh, about 20 years now. Um, so being able to see some of the, the applications of it um, is really great, uh, especially the, the split plot stuff. I spent a lot of time working on the, the um, optimal builds and the REML routines. So I was really enjoying seeing that in, in action. Um, so yeah, I am uh, a developer, not a statistician. Um, so keep that in mind as I'm, I'm giving you this, this presentation of Stati 360 and Python. Uh, I'm going to focus a lot on on the code involved. Um, so I'll be showing a fair amount of Python code. If you're not a Python developer, you're not really familiar with Python, that's fine. Um, I'm going to be putting up all of this code in a GitHub repository and also as a uh, Python package in the in the Python package repository. So you will have an opportunity to to look at this code again after the presentation and and run it and, and see what it does. All right, so first I'm gonna talk a little bit about what Python is, um, just real briefly kind of uh, go over uh, why we chose it as uh, the scripting language for, for Stati 360. And then I'm gonna show how to connect Stati 360 with Python and then get into a few examples. And then there'll be some time for QA after that. So Python is about 30 years old. It was created in 91 by a guy named Guido von Rossum. Um, he wanted to create a replacement for uh, a language called ABC, which is similar to the basic programming language, if you're familiar with that. Uh, and one of the, the goals of ABC and again, uh, Python uh, is that it would be easy to learn. So the syntax is a lot more natural than a language like C. Um, so, for example, if you want to do a logical and uh, in C, you use a double ampersand operator. In Python, it's just literally the word and. So this and that rather than this ampersand ampersand that. Um, <clears throat> another goal of Python is that it, it's highly productive. Uh, so you, you don't have to write as much code to get the same task done as some other languages. And just to give you an example of that. Um, I'm going to show uh, in one of the later examples how to fetch data from an online API. Um, and in Python, or, I'm sorry, in Design Expert, we do something similar with our auto update feature, and that's written in C++, and, and that's about a thousand lines compared to less than 10, as I'll show you in, in Python. Um, and part of the reason it is so powerful and productive is that it's very extensible. There are a lot of packages available. Um, in PyPI, which is their, their package repository. So any given task that you're interested in doing in Python, there's probably a package out there that can help you out with that and reduce the amount of work that you've got to do. It's also very scalable. So the, the Python interpreter itself is written in C. Um, so it plays very well with, with C code, which uh, is in general quite fast. Um, there are some very large applications that are written in Python, such as YouTube and Spotify that are dealing with massive amounts of data, and large numbers of users, and they're able to be responsive and performant. And it's one of the most popular programming languages in the world, uh, especially among data scientists. And this was a, a big driver of why we, we use Python um, in Stati 360. So if you go to a data science conference, you're gonna see a lot of Python code. Um, from those guys 
it's becoming very popular in academia and, and it's definitely popular in the commercial world as well. We've used it here at Stadis since about 2015. We rewrote all of our <clears throat> internal testing with Python. We do a fair amount of prototyping with it. Uh, of course, we, we use R quite a bit as well for prototyping. And here's just an example of the popularity from the Tyobe community um, index. It just passed Java this month, um, according to this index. So it's the second most popular language. This is based on um, search engine data. And one of the reasons it's so popular is uh, the, the ecosystem of packages that are available. A lot of really high quality um, statistical and scientific packages. So stats models does uh, regression, time series analysis, survival analysis, and a lot more. Um, SciPy has optimization routines like Neld or Mead that we use in Design Expert, uh, linear algebra and signal processing, things like that. Matplotlib is great for visualizing your data. Scikit-learn is a machine learning uh, package. Uh, so that does classification, regression, clustering, Pandas is a package for dealing with large volumes of data. And then uh, NumPy is a, more of a core package that implements um, matrices and linear algebra code. Um, and that's that actually has a vectorized C code at, at its core, so it's it's fairly fast. Um, they, uh, you can actually provide your own LA pack of an implementation with NumPy. So if you have something like the math kernel library from Intel, which is a very high speed Linear algebra library, you can you can use that with NumPy. Okay, to connect Python to Stadis 360 is very simple. Uh, there is a tutorial online and in the Stadis 360 help that goes into how to do it with a virtual environment, which is handy if you are doing a lot of Python programming. But if you're only going to use Python with Stadis 360, all you need to do is install it. You need to pip install our um, Python module from, from the PyPI package repository, and then um, you're ready to go. So I can show you the uh, Python window here. You just got to click on this little Python icon, and it brings up a script window. So on the left side, you can write code. It's got syntax highlighting and um, a few other features on the, so just like a little text editor there. And then your output shows up on the right. So if I do a little hello world, which you've got to do if you're doing a programming presentation. And then this button will run the script and prints out hello world. And you can see it's it's using a Python um, installation in my home directory, but if you just install Python normally, then it would show up in program files or what have you. Okay, uh, so the first example I'm going to show is a uh, multiple response graph. So I'm, I have a design already analyzed with two uh, two analyzed models. Um, so we're going to connect to SATIS 360, grab those two analyzed models, and then make predictions for both of them and plot them on the same plot using Matplotlib. So the first thing you're going to want to do in your script is connect to Stadis360 using the connect function. Just grab a little laser pointer here. Um, so we import the Stadis package and I've renamed it here just for conciseness. I'll do that in all the, the scripts. We connect, uh, call it, we just call connect and it creates a client object. And this connects on port 4900 by default. So this is, um, it, it is a TCP IP connection between Stadis360 and Python. That probably doesn't mean anything to you, but what will happen is Windows Defender will say, hey, this program is trying to get out to the internet. You get a firewall warning. It is not going out onto your network at all. It uses just the local um, communications, the local host. Uh, so you just need to say yes to that, that warning that it's okay. And then you've got this client object. So this object will operate on whatever design is loaded in SETI 360 at the time. Um, which is handy if you just want to run a kind of a generic script on whatever design you have open. Otherwise, there is an open design function that you can use to fetch a design from the file system. 
So we want to grab an analysis object for both of these analyses. Um, and to do that, we need the name of the analysis. So we'll use the list analyses function on that client object to grab a list of analysis names. And then I've just taken the first and second analysis names and um, fetch the analysis for both of those and then stuff them into another list here. Those analysis objects can be used to set a model, auto select. Um, we're gonna use them to do predictions because there's already a model um, analyzed for those. And I can show you that design here. So this is actually just a modified version of our chemical conversion tutorial data. So there's two responses, conversion to the percentage and the activity response. And as you can see, I've got two analyzed models here. One of them is quadratic and the other one is, I believe, cubic. Yeah. So I'll just show you that code here. So this is the code from the slide. We're grabbing those analyses. I'm just going to print them out to show that it's loading them. So we have a conversion and our activity analyses here. Now that we have those analyses, we can generate a set of points uh, that we want to predict at. So we're, since we're going to be plotting this, uh, we want to generate points for, uh, in this case, we're going to vary factor A from negative one to one. Uh, and for that, I'm using a NumPy function called linspace. It's probably just as easy to do in a loop, but um, since I already have NumPy, I'll just go ahead and use that. This generates uniform values from negative one to one. I'm going to generate 50 of them. So that list looks something like this. And then we'll create a centroid point because we want to leave B and C at their uh, midpoints here. And then this part is where we iterate over those A values, although I called them X here for some reason. Uh, and we'll put those, those values into the centroid, which gives us a list of points with A varying from negative one to one and B and C fixed at zero. And then we just pass those points to the predict function of our analysis objects. We're going to tell it that those are coded values and we get predictions. So this is the, the uh, conversion analysis predicting at 78% for the, for the low value uh, and then going up from there. And now that we have those predicted values, we can use matplotlib to plot line graphs for both of them. And I kind of grayed out some of the code that I was using to fiddle with these axes. Um, the real meat of it is, is the bolded lines. So we're going to create an axis here with the subplots function and then just plot. This is our, our X, um, those, those lin space values from negative one to one, and then the predicted conversion values in Y1. We'll make that one green, give it a name. And then we're going to duplicate that axis. Um, and matplotlib knows to, to stick that on the right side here. And that's where we'll plot our activity uh, predictions and just make those blue. And then you show the plot. And that gives you a nice um, depiction of the two responses on one plot. I can show you that in, oops. Okay, didn't need to stop my slideshow there, but. So this is an accumulation of all the code that I've shown so far. And we'll just run that. So that, that show function pops up this, this window. This is a matplotlib window. Get back to my slideshow. Okay, so that's nice. Um, we can take that a step further. So using the same technique here, um, we can generate some more prediction points. And this time we're gonna set B to negative one and then to one and generate two more sets of predictions with that conversion analysis. You can see we have similar list of points here with B at its negative one value and then B at its uh, one value. If you do that, you get um, four lines here. So we have sort of an interaction plot for B, uh, sorry, for conversion with B at its low and its high as the dashed and dotted lines. And then you've got your activity response and um, conversion at its at the centroid, the B of the centroid. 
so now we're getting quite a good picture of what's going on um, with our, our two responses. And if, if let's say you're not interested in a conversion rate below you know, 80 or 82, you could look at that and say, okay, that B low value is not very interesting. Um, and you could, let's pull up the next one here. You could change that B low value to 0.5. It's not really B low anymore, but that's all you need to modify. Um, and you could rerun that. Trying to drag this window over here. There we go. So now you've got a uh, line for B at the 0.5 value. Or sorry, conversion with B at the, at the 0.5 level. So at this point, you could even, if you're interested in minimizing activity and targeting 84 as conversion, you might say, okay, well, I'll just set time to 1.25. Uh, so that, that would be handy. Uh, you probably would want to run the optimization at the end of the day anyway, but um, this, this gives you a nice picture of your your responses. Okay, for the second example, <clears throat> this is to demonstrate grabbing data from an online uh, API, two of them actually. Um, this is, uh, I'm gonna get some stream flow data from the USGS API and some precipitation and temperature data from NOAA. And we'll use the precipitation and temperature data to try to predict the um, basically the surge in a, a stream um, near where we're gathering the, the precipitation data. So we'll get that data from those APIs, and uh, we're going to have to format that data. It comes with all sorts of um, extra things in it. So we're going to pluck out the data that we want and then actually do a little bit of uh, transformation of it. And then we'll send that data to Stati360, fit a model, and then graph it with another package called Plotly. And uh, you'll see why once we, we get there, why I'm using a third or a second um, graphing package. So like I said at the outset, connecting to an online API and retrieving data with Python is very easy to do. Uh, this is really only two lines of code here that um, are doing the actual work. So we're using this request package to do that. Um, this part, we are uh, basically telling NOAA what, what we're interested in. So this is a station ID for the Minneapolis St. Paul Airport. We want the precipitation data for, for that day, uh, the max temperature and the date range is just a single day here. Although the, in the actual example, I gathered um, 10 years worth of data. We're gonna stuff those uh, pieces of data into a URL and send it out with a token that I'm, I'm not showing here, but NOAA requires uh, authorization. So I have a, a token that I need to send as well. And then we get that data back in a, a JSON format, which is just a, a data interchange format that's very popular for, for APIs like this. Um, and I can kind of show you what that looks like uh, actually in the browser. So there's nothing really magical about this um, this call here. Um, so if I if I put uh, this is the USGS URL, not the NOAA one, but similar. We have a site ID and a date. If you just put that in your browser, you get you can get get that JSON data straight from their API. Um, so you, you wouldn't want to do this because it's not very helpful to to look at. But um, this is what we're getting with that request library. And you can see here, yesterday the stream was at. Um, two cubic feet per second uh, of flow. So that data is readily available. Uh, and this is just the output of the NOAA call. Uh, so we got the, just that one day, September 13th. And here we're getting precipitation and temperature data, but it's in tenths of a millimeter and tenths of Celsius, uh, which I, don't think anybody really uses those units in you know visually to look at so i, I converted those in python to um inches in fahrenheit uh just so to make the the graphs a little bit easier to read um, so that that's the the something you can do in python very easily is you know transform your data before sending it to, to Stati 360. 
we're also going to further modify this data by dropping all of the um, the days with zero precipitation and then accumulating all of the days with consecutive rainfall into rain events. Um, so each rain event will have a total precipitation and average temperature. And then for the flow of the stream, what we're interested in is the uh, difference in the flow from the day prior to the rainfall uh, to the peak after. So we're, we're looking at the impact of that precipitation event on the flow of the stream. So uh, I'm not gonna show that code here, but we've got these three lists now um, once we've done that, that modifying of the data. So to get that data into STATI 360, um, I should say I, I have a, a pre-made um, empty design that we're gonna be putting these into. Um, so we'll open that design using the same, uh, sorry, we were gonna use an open design function, but I, I talked about it earlier, I didn't show it. Um, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, we're not gonna use the open design function, we're just gonna manually open the design. So I have that already pre-made here, uh, empty. There we go. So this design has a precipitation and temperature factor and the flow response. Okay. So to populate those factors and responses, we'd first need to get the factor object. And similar to the analysis object we used earlier, this is a proxy for the factor that is in STATI 360. So anything we do with this factor is reflected in STATI 360. Um, if we assign a value to the name property or the units property, it gets put into the STATI 360. And then there's this values um, list, which you can read or write. And once we write the precipitation list to that values property, uh, that column will be populated in STATI 360. We're gonna do the same thing with the temperature and flow response. And this is just an image of the help, just a portion of the help. Every uh, Python class is, is documented in this way in the Steady360 help, and it's also available online. So now that we've got our data in Steady360, we wanna analyze it. We don't have an analysis yet because we just created this design. So we're gonna have to use the create analysis function, which takes a response name and an analysis name. And then we're gonna set um, a 2FI model and look at the ANOVA. And I can just show you that in Stati 360. So we're gonna run uh, so here's the flow, temperature, and precipitation lists. Um, I've just I've created a kind of a helper function that will be available in the code that I upload uh, just to grab those lists. Okay, so it's done the analysis now and we can go look and see that uh, this design is populated with precipitation, temp, and flow, and we've got our 2FI model. Okay, and you can see the R squared value is not great, but this is just happenstance data that I grabbed from online. So uh, maybe 0.49 is not too bad for this sort of thing. Um, the, <clears throat> the model itself is significant. So we have some significant p-values here. The precipitation factor has a positive coefficient, which makes sense. It's increasing the flow of the stream when it rains. The temperature has a negative coefficient, also makes sense that there's some you know, evaporation effect, and there's also an interaction with a negative slope. All right, so now I'm gonna graph that with the Plotly package. <clears throat> and the reason I'm doing this with Plotly and not Matplotlib is because Plotly has this really nice um, 3D interface. Uh, Matplotlib does have 3D plots, but they're, they're not quite as nice. And we're going to use a similar technique to how we graphed the um, line plots. We'll generate uniform, um, basically, ticks across X and Y. And then we're going to make predictions. This time we're predicting um, you know, 20 points at a time and filling in this Z. This is essentially a grid of predictions. And then with Plotly, you just create a surface, give it an X, Y, and Z value. 
uh, this contours bit is just to to put this this grid on there to make it a little bit easier to see the the um, the curve. So to pull that up. And it, it actually creates a little web browser interface here. So you can rotate that plot around. It's got a crosshair. Of course, this is something you can already do um, with Steady 360. So it's not too exciting. Um, I'm just going to talk about the model a little bit. It, it is a little bit nonsensical in that it's predicting uh, a, an increase in flow with. Uh, five inches of rain at 30 degrees so that the flow actually increases as the temperature drops below freezing. So, um, kind of, kind of nonsensical, maybe not a great model. Uh, Stati 360 does recommend a cubic model. So just look at that real quick. Um, <clears throat> that the shape of this is a little bit makes a little bit more sense that it tails off at the colder temperatures, um, but you do have this negative prediction here for high temperature, high precipitation, which doesn't really make sense either. And the reason for that is that the data, um, we just don't have any data at those, those corners. It doesn't typically rain a lot when it's 100 degrees here in Minnesota, and the same thing for when it's below freezing. So. Um, would definitely would not trust those corners of the of the predictions. Um, but the reason I, I mentioned that is that, uh, like I said, just being able to plot a contour is not that interesting. With Plotly, you can add as many uh, surfaces as you want. Um, so I thought it'd be neat to see two surfaces on one plot. So I created a second analysis with the cubic model using the same response. Generated a grid the exact same way by uh, predicting at those prediction points with that cubic analysis this time. And then here we're creating that initial uh, 2FI surface and then an, an, a second surface with the Z2 values. And I made that transparent uh, just because otherwise the plot gets quite busy. And you can see the two plots overlaying there in the, in the slide. I'll just go ahead and uh, actually reopen this design and show you that. Okay, so there it's doing the uh, 2FI analysis and then the cubic. So it's it's thinking it's taking a little bit here. All right, there. So now you can see the separation of the two surfaces in this middle part where we've got most of our data. Um, so maybe you'd want to use the cubic model in that area. And I don't know if this model makes sense at all. But um, like I said, this is just to demonstrate some of the capabilities of, of uh, Python and Plotly. So don't dwell too much on my terrible model. All right, so the final example here is uh, cross-validation. So I'm going to go through actually a couple of, of cross-validation examples um, using Python and Stati360. So cross-validation is a way to uh, validate a model when you can't gather additional data to, to do verification runs. Um, you split your data into segments, and Montgomery Peck and Vining call them estimation and prediction sets. Uh, typically in machine learning nomenclature, you'd see train and test. I'm going to stick with the Montgomery Peck and Vining terminology for this, this demonstration. <clears throat> There's also K-fold cross-validation where you further divide the design space up and then uh, make predictions using, uh, sorry, you, you set aside one fold at a time, make predictions, estimate a model using the remaining folds, and then make predictions against the uh, 
the fold that you set aside. And I'll get into that, how that works. Uh, but first you need to decide how you're going to evaluate those folds. So there's a bunch of different scores or metrics that you can use. Uh, this table is from Scikit-Learn. They have a bunch of uh, metrics that are more germane to machine learning, um, but they do have some regression oriented metrics like R squared or mean squared error. So you'd score each different fold based on how well it predicts based on some, some metric and then uh, decide whether or not your model is validated based on those scores. So you're looking for a consistently good score across the different splits. So I'm gonna show this delivery time example from introduction to linear analysis. Uh, it's a measurement of how long it takes a person to deliver a number of cases of soda to a vending machine. And the two factors are the amount of cases they're bringing, the distance the vending machine is, and then they measure the delivery time in minutes. They divided the data into two sets, estimation and prediction, like I mentioned. The way that they did the, the division of the sets was actually using a distance-based algorithm called duplex from a 1977 paper by Ronald Snee. And they did not evaluate the reverse. So they didn't take the prediction set and turn it into an estimation set and vice versa. So here's that example. Uh, I have populated the comments field with P's and E's for the prediction and estimation runs uh, as they indicated them in the, in the textbook. And you can see from this scatter plot, the checkboxes are the prediction runs and they're, they're pretty evenly distributed. This is historical data as well. So it's not, uh, it's not a design experiment. So to prep, prep the analysis here, um, we're first going to load this delivery time example that I showed in the previous slide, and then we're going to get that comments column using the, the Steady's 360 client here. And the reason for that is that we're going to iterate over that comments list and separate out. So if the comments field is a P, we're going to add that run to the prediction set. Otherwise, it goes in the estimation set. So these are just lists of run indices that we'll use later. Uh, just to talk a little bit about the score that they used, um, they used a predicted R squared, um, which is also available in Scikit-Learn as, as an R2 score. So this is just the basically the residuals of the predictions um, for that prediction set. So the uh, we're predicting with the estimate model and comparing it to the to the observed values in that prediction set. And then the uh, total sums of squares on the bottom here is actually the total sums of squares of just the prediction set, not the whole design. And that gives you a R squared uh, value for that split. So to do this in Python is, is fairly simple. Um, <clears throat> we have that list of, of prediction runs in that prediction set list. So we just iterate through those. We, we're going to create a list of factor settings um, that we're gonna to use to predict. And then we also keep track of the observed values because we need those to calculate those uh, residuals. And this is really the, the crux of it here. So um, we're gonna take that prediction set and ignore those rows and then do the analysis. So our analysis consists of only the estimation set at this point. Uh, they used a linear model and we're just gonna pass in those prediction points. So the nomenclature gets a little confusing here. I think if, if you use test and train instead of estimate and predict, it might get a little, a little clearer, but um, these prediction points are the points in the prediction set. We're predicting or we're, we're estimating uh, using our estimate model. Oops. Um, and getting a list of predictions for those those runs. And then we just pass those right into this R2 score function, and it gives us this 0.922 for the R squared predicted, and that uh, coincides with what they found in the textbook. So they considered that model to be validated with a, a, a fairly good R2 score there. 
They didn't do a, a K fold validation, but we can go ahead and, and do that on the same data set. Uh, Scikit-learn has a K fold function that divides your data into uh, however many splits you want. It can also randomize your data as it does it, but uh, this was already randomized, so I elected not to do that. And it gives you a list of test and train indices, just like we had before. So the first set is um, the uh, test data is runs one through 10, and the training set is the remaining um, three folds here. And it, it, it just iterates through those. So the next time you iterate through this uh, split function, you would get runs 11 through 20 as the test set, and then runs one through 10 and 21 through 40 as the training set. So using that same technique we used in the previous slide here, um, we're gonna generate some R2 scores for those different um, sets of runs, and they're all pretty good. So again, that model we would consider validated. You can also uh, use cross-validation to select a model. Here I have just generated a, um, kind of a wavy surface using uh, this equation down at the bottom, just a, a simulation. And then I fit uh, an OLS model to it. In this case, uh, Steady360 recommended a quartic model. And I also used our new Gaussian process analysis to fit a surface as well. And you can kind of see how each one of those is doing just visually from the 3D surface here. So the code is the exact same as we used for the Montgomery example. Um, we're splitting, in this case, we're going to do eight splits. Um, there's 80 runs. This is a, a Latin hypercube design. So each split has 10 runs in the um, prediction set and 10 and, eight, and 70 runs in the estimation set. And in this case, I'm using a slightly different metric. This is the mean squared error. The numerator is the same, but uh, the denominator is the number of samples rather than the, sums of, the total sums of squares of the prediction set. And you can see, as you would expect from looking at those 3D surfaces, that the Gaussian process model does uh, a, a bit better than um, the OLS model. The average of all the splits for OLS was 0.5, and the average for Gaussian process was 0.5. Three, three. So you could say that the Gaussian process model did a little bit better. Whether or not that's enough to use that over a traditional OS model, it's really up to the practitioner. And then just for another example here, uh, I simulated the plain old quadratic model. And uh, I'm not showing the true surface here because the OLS analysis pretty much nailed it. That's exactly what it looks like. The Gaussian process model did a, a little bit worse. You can see there's a little bit of dog earring in the corner there, uh, but still a pretty accurate picture of the surface there. So using the same number of folds, um, dividing up that data into groups of 10 and 70, the OLS model did really well, as you'd expect. And you can see here that the Gaussian process model, while it did okay in uh, seven of the eight splits, this uh, number six <clears throat> did really poorly. So I took a look at the observed and predicted values for that split, and uh, you can see it predicted uh, well under the observed value here, which is what drove that uh, residual value really high. And if you look at that run 59, Here we've got this 80 run Latin hypercube. Um, that's right in the corner here. So when we do that split, fold six, we were actually removing that run along with nine other runs. And the Gaussian process model, which doesn't, you know, interpolates between observed values, doesn't know what to do in that corner and, and it drops way off from the, the actual value should be around 1600 there. So that is the cross-validation example.
All right, hopefully I didn't rush through this too fast. Like I said, the code is gonna be available online. Um, so you'll be able to, to go through it at your leisure. Um, I'm really excited about this Python feature. I, I love Python and being able to do all sorts of cool stuff with Stati 360 and Python is, is really exciting. Um, there's lots of stuff you can do with Matplotlib and Plotly for graphing all sorts of different things. They have heat maps, they've got you know histograms and pretty much anything you wanna do. Um, it's very easy to retrieve data from an API, from a database, from the cloud, from sensors. There's all sorts of packages in Python for communicating um, in that manner. You can pre-process your data, transform your X values, you know, things like that prior to, to going out to the Stati360 and, and analyzing it. And then there's all sorts of advanced analysts and validation techniques, techniques such as cross-validation that are not yet available in Stati360 that you can get at with, with Python. Then we're gonna be adding more uh, endpoints as we go along. Um, for example, being able to get the half normal plot um, as a series of coordinates in Python, um, things like that, um, we'll be adding going forward. And that's it, happy coding. Um, there's a couple of links there. Uh, they're not up yet, um, but they will be shortly. And uh, yeah, I'll stick around for questions from from sherry all right thank you so much hank that was a um super interesting presentation i do not know anything about python coding so um it was um interesting to see how they can connect and what you can do um yeah um oh i will say that um we are going to ship a couple of example scripts with with uh status 260 as well um, so those will be available in there's a tutorial, I believe. Okay. Um, here's a question, uh, and I don't know if you'll be able to comment much on it, um, but I'll, I'll read it off to you and see. Uh, when uh, From John Davies, when I have a subject matter expert knowledge, whoops, I'm sorry, the question flipped. I have to refresh my screen. Um, okay. When I have SME knowledge about the physical relationships between my factors, and I know that there are nonlinear effects, is that a case where I may be better off with a Gaussian model as opposed to OLS? Um, yeah, so I, I, I am not a statistician, um, yeah. but yeah, from my understanding, uh, yes, the Gaussian process model, um, because it, it is an interpolation, um, may do better in situations where a regular polynomial would not fit the surface but definitely a question for for martin or or, uh, or someone with that sort of knowledge okay um from franco and zani some questions about the evolution of se360 in the short and medium term will in the future the python modules be distributed via conda 2 or exclusively via pip for a Python Anaconda user, it's important to know this in advance. Yeah, um, I guess I, I'm, I, I've i used Conda, uh, definitely. Um, I'm not familiar with their um, procedure for getting packages into their repository. With PIP, it's um, just a matter of creating an account and publishing it. So, um, yeah, that's definitely something we can look into. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that they are pretty open to having a package like Steady's in their their repository. So yeah, I will um, look into that. Okay, following on with that, are additional commands scheduled to the internal editor of SE360, obviously without the need to make it a complete editor, but that can help a better management of the code and errors, oh, but, but that can help a better management of the code and errors directly in SE360. Um, so if I understand so, the question correctly, he's asking if we're going to expand on the features of the code editor. Yeah, that's what I think so. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, as um, as we see the need for for better code editing features, we will definitely add them. Um, we don't really want to uh, be developing an, a whole IDE ourselves. Um, so there is. Uh, 
and I think Frank has seen this actually, the, there is a listen function where you can, um, rather than run the code from within Status 360, you can run it from your favorite IDE like JetBrains or, or what have you. Um, and it will communicate directly with Status 360 rather than running it through here. Um, but yeah, if there's easy things we can do to make the, this scripting interface better, then we would definitely um, do that. Yep. Okay. And um, one last comment from Franco, which uh, says why why um, the load Python files and auto listen start commands were not implemented directly in the GUI interface, but it is needed the no GUI version of SC three hundred and sixty. Yeah, there is a um, there is a, a non GUI version that will just basically listen um, that I, I, I use quite a bit um, that ships with Sati three hundred and sixty. So you can just run run that from the command prompt and it just sits and listens for commands from the Python package. Great. Uh, Michael Williams says, thank you for the example scripts. They will be helpful. Uh, Niles Burmeister, why do cross, okay, why do cross validation when you have a predicted R squared? That might just be a function yeah, example. No, I, um, that, that's true. We do have predicted R squared values in Design Expert and Stati 360. Um, I know there is some literature, so the, the predicted R squared in, in Design Expert is a leave one out calculation. Um, and I know that there is some literature on that saying that it's better to do uh, fewer, um, like four or five folds or something of, along those lines. But um, yeah, I, I, I can't really answer that with much authority. Um, John Davies says, I use DX a lot. How do I get started learning Python? That's a good general question. Yeah, I mean, one of the great things about Python is that it is so popular. There is a wealth of resources online. Um, so uh, you can find all sorts of introductory tutorials there. Um, otherwise, uh, once I get this code up, you might be able to to figure out some, some things just from looking at some example code. It really depends on your, your programming experience if you have any at all, you might be able to, to pick that up. Otherwise, um, yeah, going online, just looking for Python introductory tutorials, there's tons out there. 